I know it's maybe overstated, but it's true, that we do come from kings and queens. We come from a great place. We have a great lineage, and we have to live up to that. Our story began millions of years ago in the motherland, the cradle of all civilization, the richest place on earth. I'm talking, of course, about Africa. European culture plundered Africa, and their rewriting of African history has been an attempt to justify the pillage and absolve their guilt. After centuries of extractive colonial rule, the project has been to portray the entire African continent as poverty-stricken, diseased, and incapable of self-rule. I don't know about you, but I've had it with the way black history is taught. It's like there's slavery, then there's the civil rights era, and then Obama, and that's it. But a wise man told me that if we start our history with slavery, the best we can aspire to be is better slaves, but our roots are much deeper than that. I'm Jay from Push Black, and today we're gonna bring real knowledge with Dr. Renoku Rashidi. Dr. Rashidi is an anthropologist and historian with a major focus on what he calls the global African presence, that is, Africans outside of Africa before and after enslavement. He's taken us back, I mean way back, to a time long before colonization, before white hands exploited the land and its people. Get ready and hang on. We're headed to the African foundations of human civilization. All right, Dr. Rashidi, first question we ask all of our guests is, what does black liberation look like for you? Right now in particular, I guess one of the key aspects of that is just to feel safe, to be safe and to feel safe in the privacy of your own home. It's to be respected. It's to be treated as a full human being uh, with the freedom to advance yourself in life without any obstacles related to race, gender, et cetera. That's what it means to me. Thank you for that. So in what ways does your work help our community work towards that vision of Black liberation? Well, I'm a historian, and so I give you uh, an African proverb that goes, if you know the beginning well, the ending will not trouble you. What I see in our community is a lot of outrage, justifiably so, but I don't see a clear roadmap. And I think that's rooted in the fact that a lot of us don't have a real clear knowledge of self. One of our great historians, a man named John Henry Clark, said that the relationship between a people and their history is exactly the same as a relationship between a mother and her child. And so I think we, we are angry, we're outraged, but we don't have a sense of direction and identity based on a clear knowledge of self. And my work tries to do that. I look at things from a global perspective. One of the things I always say is never start with slavery. Uh, if you think your history began with slavery, the best you will hope to be is a good slave. And so we want to, yeah, I know it's maybe overstated, but it's true that we do come from kings and queens. We come from a great place. We have a great lineage and we have to live up to that. That means that the B word has no place in our community and neither does the N word, that we can't shoot each other down in the street as if it doesn't really matter because we are shooting down royalty. And I think that if those things were instilled in our youth in particular, we would move the ball a lot further down the field. We can obviously unite around the oppression that's carried out on us, uh, but there doesn't seem to be a clear direction leading us elsewhere outside of these moments as far as the masses of people are concerned. In what ways do you think history can contribute to that? You touched on that, but I would like to get deeper. Where should we start if not with slavery? And how can we use that to uh, help move us forward? Well, as a historian, I would say it's not that we shouldn't discuss slavery, Let's just not start there. And even when we do talk about enslavement, and I certainly don't want to minimize the suffering of our ancestors, let's not forget that we did more than suffer, that we were more than victims, that we resisted. And that's very important. We fought back. We tried to keep the family together. But if we are going to deal with it, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Let's go back to Africa itself, which began looking like you and me. And then we look at the role of African people, because it's not enough to say you were first. 
it's very important to say what you did, the role of African people in classical civilization. In Africa in particular, we can begin with the Nile Valley civilization, the greatest civilization of them all. Egypt is in Africa and it's always been in Africa. So what we want to do is give people a sense of pride in who we are. And one of the things about ancient Egypt, or Kemet we call it, is that the line of descent was traced to the female side of the family. You actually have female pharaohs. That's a big deal to me, for Black men to respect Black women and for Black women to respect themselves and for Black men to respect themselves. And all of this is before slavery. So we need to look also at how we fell from the pyramids to the projects. But no people that I'm aware of start at their lowest point. When Europeans talk about their history, they're not talking about the Beverly Hillbillies. They're talking about Greece and Rome. They're talking about the finest aspects in their minds of their history. Well, African people have a history that is the greatest that's never been told. And it's up to us to tell it and give us a sense of pride and dignity and a newfound sense of self-esteem. And I think that is so important. What you do for yourself depends on what you think of yourself. And what you think of yourself depends on what you know of yourself. And what you know of yourself depends on what you have been told. And what are we told? Either we don't have a history or it's a history of enslavement or remote African jungle. Get over it. But you never hear Jewish people talk about get over the Holocaust. Even now, people say, remember the Titanic. There's always a movie about George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and Shakespeare and Einstein. But what about our history? You can directly measure people's status in the world by the emphasis that they put on their history and culture. Powerful people do it all the time and cram it down your throat. Weak people say, I ain't got time for that. I got to hustle. You know, let's move on. In terms of this idea that white folks gave us civilization, but it being the opposite. So what are the key elements of civilization that we can point to that African civilizations contributed to the world? Well, when we talk about civilization, we're talking about something with, at least me, basic component parts like metallurgy, the use of metal weapons and tools. And urbanization, people live in cities, towns, and villages, and writing systems or scripts, and agricultural science. Those are the rudiments of civilization, the component parts. But I think that when we use the word civilization, we're talking about culture. We're talking about a level of sophistication and a lifestyle. And Africans have really been at the forefront of that. The great civilizations that Europeans trace their lineage to and like to talk about the most are Greece and Rome. We've all heard of Julius Caesar. We've all, all heard of Alexander the Great, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But those civilizations were profoundly influenced by African people themselves. I mean, you couldn't hardly keep the Greeks out of Africa. And the Romans were in Africa and Egypt for 500 years and North Africa for longer than that. And so much of what we consider Greco-Roman civilization really has its roots in Africa itself. And even much later. After the fall of the Roman Empire, for example, Europe falls into what is called the Dark Ages. And is Africans called Moors, who came out of Northwest Africa, who went into Spain in 711 and reintroduced civilization to Western Europe, took Europe out of the Dark Ages, even things as fundamental as basic human hygiene, changing clothes, taking a bath, as well as mathematics and astronomy, all of those things are infused again into Europe after the fall of the Roman Empire by the Moors of North Africa. And it was not until the defeat of the Moors in 1492 by Isabella and Ferdinand that you have the beginning of what's called the Age of Exploration. And with the scientific knowledge of the Moors, Europeans began to explore and begin to navigate. And of course, the rest is history. So you can't separate the influence of African people on Europeans themselves. Other peoples of the world, and let's talk about white people specifically, they have these origin stories for what they call Western civilization. So no matter what type of white person you are, like if you're from Ireland, you're still taught to look towards ancient Greece and ancient Rome and see that as part of you and have pride in that. But Black folks don't have that in the way you're describing, we aren't taught to look towards the Nile Valley civilizations and our other great civilizations. But one thing I've been seeing recently is that we have people within our own community that seem to detract from us even looking into that part 
of our history. I've heard people say like black folks in America have no connection to ancient Egypt or you should be looking at West African history. And I'd like for you to speak on what your thoughts are on that and uh, why it's valuable for black folks in America specifically to look toward the Nile Valley as one of the ways we can get back in touch with where we've been and what we've accomplished. Excellent question. One of the things that I get sometimes is that we, some of the African center scholars that we spend too much time with the Nile Valley, too much time with Egypt. And we say the Nile Valley because it wasn't just Egypt, but Egypt is the most well-known and most spectacular of what we might call the kingdoms of the ancient Nile Valley. I don't think we talk about Egypt too much, but I think that we need to do a better job connecting Egypt with the rest of Africa. One of the reasons we spend a lot of time with Egypt, in addition to the fact that it was so spectacular and so much archeological and historical work has been done there, Egypt in a sense has been taken out of Africa to the point that the average person, I dare say, would not connect ancient Egypt with Africa. The average person does not see black folk building those pyramids. That's because that's the way the popular media projects Egypt, as it's in a vague, nebulous place, the Near East, the Middle East, and in this place, Black people only existed as slaves and servants. So a lot of us feel like we have a historic duty to reconnect Egypt with the rest of Africa, and just Egypt was just so spectacular, and it lasted for thousands of years. Now, what I try to do in my work is to show that while the Nile Valley civilization was, in my opinion, the most spectacular of all the ancient African civilizations, it was by no means the only one. And that civilization existed all over Africa. We also have knowledge that there were migrations from the Nile Valley. And so many of the very people in West Africa that were captured, kidnapped, enslaved, and brought to the Americas, in fact, have a direct or even or perhaps indirect relationship to the Nile Valley. So I don't think we can talk about Egypt too much. But yeah, we need to talk about Mali and Ghana and Songhai and Zimbabwe and Mona Matopa and Nak and Benin and Carthage and Morocco and all the others. Probably about 10 years ago, I was in London. I went to the British Museum, I believe, and they had a uh, exhibit in there about ancient Egypt. And I looked at all the statues and it was all white folks. It looked like the Greek statues that I saw, you know, in other hall. And I didn't know anything about ancient Egypt at this time. So I'd ask you for our audience, could you lay out some sort of high level timeline for the periods of ancient Egypt that were black and when it started to be overtaken by outside forces? No, we could do a whole series of programs just on that alone. Ancient Egypt, we call Kemet the black city or the black community. This is Egypt of the pharaohs or dynastic Kemet. And there are several basic phases. You have what's called, first of all, the pre-dynastic period, which stretches thousands of years back into antiquity. And then you have the first golden age, which we call the pyramid age. And this is when these massive monuments were constructed by African people, not slaves. That's the first golden age. And then you have the period that traditional Egyptologists call the Middle Kingdom. The first golden age will be from around 2700 BC to about 2200 BC. And then the second golden age is called the Middle Kingdom. This is dynasties 11 and 12. A dynasty is a family of rulers, one member of the family coming after the other for an extended period of time. So this will be from around 2000 BC to about 1700 BC. And then you have the third golden age, which is called the New Kingdom. And this is dynasties 18, 19, and 20. This begins in 1560, and it ends around 1200 BC. This is where you have Ramses the Great, Hatshepsut, Akhenaten, Nefertiti, all these people whose names, Tutankhamun. And then you have a fourth golden age, and this is called the period of Nubian domination. During this period of time, beginning around 700 BC, Black people from south of Egypt called Nubia came and conquered Egypt and ruled Nubia itself. And they had a, a, an empire that stretched from Khartoum, Sudan to Jerusalem. So these are the, basically the golden ages. And there are many, many subdivisions even amongst them as well. Great kings. And I guess you could say in large measure, this is a time when black folk ruled the world. Our last great walk in the sun, you might even say. From what I understand, there are different cultural elements that can be traced from the Nile Valley to other parts of the continent, right? Like I've read a bit about the, uh, the Dogon and Mali and how some of their beliefs and practices stem from there. Are you familiar with this or can you speak to this? There's an excellent book, in my opinion, the best book on the subject called The Cultural Unity of Black Africa. But shake on to Job, D-I-O-P, and he was able to say that wherever you are in Africa, there are certain common bonds. People tend to bury the dead. 
people tend to have an optimistic worldview. There were certain things that you can bind all of Africa with. And so certainly the Dogon are no exception to that. The Dogon, for those who may not know, are a group of African stargazers in Mali. And they have a knowledge of astronomy, of the solar system, that very few people have, and they've had it for a very long time. And so many Western scholars can't figure out who these people are traditionally viewed as primitives, would know something, say, for example, about Sirius B, a white star that's imploded upon itself. They know more about that than Western scholars know. So to me, this is an exciting time that we're living in, in spite of everything, because we're finding out little by little, more and more, just what we've contributed to the world. What we want to do is change our view of Africa. I've lectured, I think, in 67 countries now. I've lectured all over the world. And sometimes, not always in front of Black folk. And sometimes, just to break the ice, I ask people, what do you think of when you think of Africa? And I get a lot of answers, but three never fail. One is wild animals, another is poverty, and another is disease. In other words, we have an overwhelmingly negative image of Africa. And it's my belief that you can't hate the roots of the tree without hating the fruits of the tree. So we wanna change that. We wanna take Africa from the periphery of our imaginations and put it right in the center of our consciousness. I grew up, I'm 66 years of age, with an image of an African native running through the jungle with a big Afro, yelling ooga ooga booga, a spear in his hand, a bone in his nose, looking for a missionary or an explorer for dinner. Now who would wanna identify with that? And unfortunately, a lot of that image still pervades the consciousness of people, including African-Americans. So we must begin to change that. And as we begin to change it, I think that we begin to see ourselves in a different light and we respect ourselves more. And if we respect ourselves more, we will allow ourselves to be disrespected less. So that is the essence. Knowledge of self is not just some abstract thing. It's not just dates and facts and figures. It's the story of a people. It's the life of a people. And we need to do a better job as black folk in telling the world that. I think that we've kind of waited for other people to do it for us. And that's where we make a big mistake. We're the ones we've been waiting for. I love that. We're the ones we've been waiting for. Oh, yeah. I'd like to understand how you came to do this work. What were the things that made you get a deeper understanding and respect for the history of our people? I am what is called a a natural, that I found something at an early age that I was good at that I enjoyed. And then I realized even then when I was in my late teens, this was a way I could make a contribution to my community. You know, I didn't mind spending a lot of time by myself studying. You know, I had a good memory. It was easy for me to digest information. And then what happened was over a period of time, I began to find and realize, and it didn't take long, the importance of visuals So not only am I a historian, I've traveled to 125 countries, been all over the world, written and edited 22 books, but now I have tens of thousands of original photographs from museums, from tombs and temples and churches. And what I'm able to do is illustrate that with the maxim that seeing is believing and a picture is worth a thousand words. But when I was a youngster, I read a book called Destruction of Black Civilization by Chancellor Williams. I was a university freshman. And I knew even then when I was 18 that I wanted to be a historian, and I've never looked back. It's always amazing to me when folks at a young age, you know, get that calling. I I know often in our community we talk about folks getting the calling to to preach the word. To me, at least a much lesser extent, getting the calling to actually work and put your talents in service of your community. Were there any apprehensions about that after reading Dr. Williams' book? You know, you're doing the same thing in your own field. Everybody can do everything, but everybody can do something. But for a long time, I had doubts. I mean, I love what I do, but I still had bills to pay. I didn't go the traditional academic route. I have two honorary doctorate degrees. I became an anthropologist through practice, through time, just observing people. So, yeah, there were a lot of challenges um, up until I was about 37, 38. So let's talk about your your travels and your work in that regard. So you've been all over the world tracing our people's history all over the world through anthropology and history. Can you speak to that part of your work? And second part of the question is, where are some of the maybe most surprising places that Black people exist or have touched that you think people would be surprised to hear about? 
Well, we've talked about Africa to some extent. I've traveled over, I think there are 54 independent countries in Africa. I think I've been to 34 and I've been in every region in Africa, so I know Africa well. But what I think intrigued me more than anything else, and again, I referenced this book, Destruction of Black Civilization by Chancellor Williams, published in 1971, but still a very good read. This was the first book that I ever read where a person talked about African people who left Africa long before enslavement. So early on, I began to develop an interest in places where I knew Black people existed, like Asia, Australia, the Pacific Islands. And so these, in some ways, are the most intriguing places. Now, in Europe, of course, I'm getting, in fact, I'm getting ready to do a webinar at the end of this month, the 30th and 31st on the African presence in early Europe. I'm hoping some of your listeners will want to participate. So we know about Africans in the world of the ancient Greeks and Romans. We know about the Black Madonnas, these miracle workers. We know, some of us know about the Moors. We know about great African personalities in European history, like Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin, the Russian father of literature, or Alexander Dumas, a man of African heritage. He wrote The Three Musketeers. But in parts of the world like Asia, for example, that's something very new. So I've been able to find evidence of Black people in ancient Cambodia and Thailand and Vietnam. I've been able to trace Black people to at least five historic dynasties in China. In Japan, we have two proverbs that have been used to suggest an African presence. One says, for a samurai to be brave, he must have a bit of Black blood. And another one says, to make a good samurai, half the blood in one's veins must be Black. We know that Fudo Mayo is the patron of the shogun, always identified as Black with happy to be nappy hair. Now, not long ago, very sadly, this brother Chadwick Boseman passed away. And the story was that he was going to do a film on a black samurai in Japan called Yasuke, or Yasuke, who lived apparently in the 16th, 17th century. Apparently, he was from Mozambique in Southeast Africa. But tradition tells us that the very first shogun, who also is a samurai, was a black man named Sakanoe Tamuo Mararo, who led the armies of Japan in the 7th century in the Arabian Peninsula. You have great African personalities like Antar the Lion. Antar had an Ethiopian mother and an African and an Arab father, and he is the pre-Islamic hero of Arabia. We know that you have an ancient African presence in the river valleys of the Tigris Euphrates. And so there's a tremendous amount of information about black people, and I find it everywhere. And what bothers me is that African people themselves have not taken the mantle or the ultimate responsibility do this kind of work because it's very, very exciting. I do presentations a lot of times in schools and nothing is more gratifying than when you can look into the eyes of a young child, black, Latino, and they're seeing these pictures and they're hearing these stories. Knowledge itself is, is transformative. And we can just look at one example after the other. Now I went to Washington High School in Los Angeles, South Central LA, and one of the brothers I went to school with was a man named Tucky Williams. This was just when nobody had even heard of the Crips. And he went on and did his thing, and I went on and did my thing. 20 years passed, and I was contacted by a friend of a brother on death row in San Quentin, convicted of committing four murders. And I was told he was one of the founders of the Crips, and he had written along with two other brothers on death row, a book on African history. And could I help them edit it and get it ready for publication? So through that, Tookie and I developed a whole new relationship. And I would talk about sometimes, he called me sometimes at three o'clock in the morning from death row and cry like a baby. Not that he was afraid to die. I don't think Tookie was afraid of anything. But he was just so angry that it took him to be in that situation where he could read books and sit and study and reflect and realize in his eyes how much his life had been wasted because he didn't have a sense of knowledge of self. We can look at Malcolm X. Malcolm X's parents were Garveyites. But at a certain point in time, Malcolm went astray and became a common criminal. And he was incarcerated. He came under the influence of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He read the historians, Carter G. Woodson and Jay Rogers, and he was transformed into our black shining prince. So I think that we can use one example after the other about how knowledge of self can change a person's life dramatically. Absolutely. Uh, that's a powerful story about Brother Tukey Williams. I wasn't aware you were connected in that way. Would you say that your knowledge of self then helped keep you on a certain path? Knowledge of self, I would say, became my path. Okay. 
But Tookie and I could have gone in the same direction. Our just circumstances were a little different. Mm-hmm. We lived basically in the same neighborhood. Neither of my parents had a formal education. You know, all of my brothers spent a good portion of their lives in prison. I had a sister who had lupus from a young age. I had another sister that got pregnant when she was 15. You know, I was the first person in my family to attend a college or university. And I think that my older brothers and sisters, and I guess my parents too, made a concerted effort to say, we're not going to let that happen to this one. But you know that uh, expression, but for the grace of God, go I, because I could have been in the same situation. It just turned out different. And you've edited a book of poetry from some of our brothers and sisters that are incarcerated, right? Is that poetry correct? and prose. Poetry and prose, okay. Can you tell a little bit of that, about that? I guess it had to be the early ni- early to mid-1980s. I was contacted by a friend of Tookie's, his girlfriend, I guess you might say. And they told me that they had this manuscript. And would I look at it? And I did. And that's how the relationship developed. And what happened was it was just a mess, a pile of, of notes and some writings here and there. You didn't have Word Perfect or Microsoft on death row in San Quentin. And so I put all that together and that became the basis of the manuscript. I really wonder for all the homicide rates that we have in the inner city, how much of that would change if these youngsters knew a little bit more about where they came from and the greatness from which they came. Mm. So again, we just want to emphasize that knowledge of self history is not an abstraction. Malcolm X used to say, of all our studies, it is history that is most qualified to reward our research. And never truer words were spoken. I love that. So I'd like to get into some of your work in South and Central America and in India specifically. Could you talk about what you've done there over time, what you found there as it relates to Black folks? Well, let's start with India. Uh, India is fascinating to me. India is the only country I've ever been to where I felt like I had entered another world. And India was really my first really, really super big trip out of the Western Hemisphere. In October 1987, there was a historic conference in India by the people called the Untouchables or Dalits. The word Dalit means crushed, broken, and oppressed. And this is a name that these sisters and brothers called Untouchables and Outcasts have given themselves. They are the most, I'm confident when I say this, the most oppressed people in the world. They have been taught for thousands of years that their very touch, perhaps the sound of their voices, will cause ritual pollution to other people. So they are ostracized and segregated more than any group of people I know of on earth. And the majority of them, based on my studies, are black. I say there are twice as many black folk in India as in Nigeria. Well, Four times as many black people in India as in Brazil. So one of the things about India, too, is it and all of these areas in the East, is that it causes us to begin to look at what we mean when we say African. What does a black person look like? And exactly who is an African? For example, if you go to the South Pacific, if you go to places like Fiji and the Solomon Islands, where I've been, you can see people with bright blonde hair. I've seen other black people with reddish reddish hair. I've seen very tall black people. I've been among the, the Batwa, so-called pygmies. And so humanity begins in Africa, and you can find the prototype of all of the humans scattered around the world. And so in India, one of the important things, again, is it causes us to begin to reexamine what is a black man or black woman and what does African identity encompass? And I think that most of us, when we think of the diaspora, we think of the Africans or African-Americans in Brazil and Jamaica and Canada, et cetera, et cetera. But when I say the African diaspora or what I prefer to call the global African community, I'm talking about an entire black world that encompasses much of Asia, Australia, and the Pacific Islands. Unfortunately for me, I became a little too popular uh, among the dollars, kind of like a folk hero. Mm. And then I would go there and I would find myself giving speeches about caste and untouchability. And the government of India was not appreciative of that. They kind of looked at me like a civil rights worker from the North going to Mississippi in 1964. I was looked upon like one of those foreigners, these outside agitators coming in to stir their negras up. And so it was made pretty clear to me that I needed to find another travel destination. We're going to take a quick break. More in a minute. Hi, this is Andrea with Push Black. One of the things we're passionate about at Push Black is building Black power. One of the ways we can build Black power is through massive, unprecedented Black voter turnout. 
Every person in our community matters. That means you. You matter. And your vote matters. Tuesday, November 3rd is Election Day. Put that in your phone. Make a plan for when you are going to vote. Help three people in your life make their plans. Hold each other to account. Make it happen. Visit pushblackvotes.com for more information and to pledge to vote in 2020. Uh, you mentioned the conference in 87, yeah. and in uh, your book, you made an address on the global unity of African people. What was the reception like when you spoke? Because it was pretty much all Indian folks, except for you and folks that came with you, right? One person came with me. Okay. Everybody else was from India. And to be honest with you, the global African presence, it, it didn't take off that well. I did two presentations. The first time I was asked to speak, it was just to open the conference. And that was to pay homage to the great leader of the Untouchables, a man, our Dallas, a man named Dr. B.R. Ambedkar. And then I gave a speech and man, hardly nobody clapped. And I realized that what I was saying didn't really resonate. So they asked me, <laughs> there was a three-day conference, the first All India Dollar Writers Conference, historical event. And so they said, Dr. Rashidi, would you like to, sp-? I think this was their way of saying, we know you screwed up and that you're nervous. Why don't you give another presentation later in the comment? I said, yeah. The next day when I came to speak, I said, listen, instead of me telling you what I want you to hear, I want you to ask me what you want to know. Tell me what you want to hear. Don't let, let me just impose on you. And it worked out beautifully. They wanted to know about lynchings. They wanted to know if communism was in the United States. They wanted to know how many African-Americans knew about untouchability. They wanted to know so many different things. And so it wasn't exactly what I intended it to be, but it was a wonderful exchange because these sisters and brothers, for the most part, had never met an African-American before, but they are influenced by us. For example, the most progressive group that I encountered is called the Kerala Dollar Panthers, Kerala's estate, and they name themselves after the Black Panther Party. And they are black, 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 and they are proud of that. And so we are developing a, a remarkable bond And I think that's why the government of India got nervous. I think the same fear exists between the enemies of African empowerment with African-Americans and people on the continent. And so I think there are deliberate efforts to to make it. We're not African. And those Africans don't like you. And you ain't got nothing to do with that. And you're an American and this is your country and forget about Africa. No, the greatest movements we've had in history have been Pan-Africanists. The Garvey movement, the biggest movement we've ever had. You can look at the success of the film Black Panther and still see a level of excitement that knowledge of self and a different perception of Africa is able to engender in our community. So I was trying to do that with Black folk in India, and I still am. We have all these Black folks all over the world. Do you think that this idea is possible, global unity of African people? Uh, What would it take and what is the hidden potential that lies in achieving that? Well, I think if nothing else, virtually every black person would agree with this statement. Black people need to come together. We got to get together. Black people need to unite. Now, we may not know how we're going to do it, but all of us, I think, realize that there's unity in strength, there's unity in numbers. Well, if the African-Americans came together, I mean, even if the black folk in your in your neighborhood, your city came together, it'd be big. And if all the African-Americans came together, it'd be wonderful. And if black folk in the United States connected with black people in Africa, oh, my God. And if black people on a global scale were to unite with Africa as the base, well, the potential is unlimited. So that's really what it's about, a global awakening of our people. That's the core of my philosophy, pan-Africanism, that black folk around the world must unite with Africa as the base, even now, in spite of everything. Africa has more natural resources than any other continent in the world. Africa is not poor. Africans are poor because they haven't been able to access that vast wealth. African-Americans, and this is very important, ironically, the descendants of people taken out of the door of no return are in such a pivotal position to shape the entire African world. We have more resources than any other group of black folk have. We have, in spite of everything, we have a relative degree of freedom. What we don't have, for the most part, is organization and cohesion and a clear sense of vision. But it's just like Jewish people. You may never go to Israel. You may live in New York City or Los Angeles all your life, but you feel a connection to Israel. 
and you protect Israel, and you put pressure on the United States government to look out for Israel, well, African-Americans have to have that same relationship with Africa. But Africans also have to reach out to us. I think that what we really need from the motherland more than anything else is a dose of affirmation and self-love. Imagine if the head of an African state would speak out about Breonna Taylor or George Floyd. Imagine how that would impact African-Americans, because I think that we kind of feel like we are a motherless child and we are led to those Africans don't like you. They don't think you're African. They don't want anything to do. And it hurts. And I think that's what we need from Africa. We need to feel like those sisters and brothers care about us. They got our back and we'll reciprocate. I love that. So would you say that your experience with our brothers and sisters on the continent has been similar as far as open arms and welcoming for you? Yeah, for the most part. You got some knuckleheads in Africa, just like you got some here. Yeah. You know, we got people even now, I'm convinced we'd rather be turds in the toilet than an African (laughs) because that's the way we're taught. And we got some fools on the continent too. Ignorance is, I mean, it's on both sides of the water. But overwhelmingly, hey, brother, Africa is my soul and my heart and my home. America is where I live. But Africa is is my heart. Africa is home to me. Right. And I don't think that's by accident, right? I don't think that's a coincidence that we view each other as separate people and that there's no connection. Would you agree with that? I do agree with it. And who benefits from it? Who benefits from our disunity? Certainly we don't. Absolutely. But I mean, once Africans in the diaspora and Africans at home get together, brother, we'll have a power base the likes of which the world has never seen. And that will happen. But it's not going to happen by itself. It's going to be very, very hard work and it's going to take time. One of the most frustrating lessons that I've had to learn, because I've been doing this all my adult life, is no matter how hard you work, you can't do it by yourself. Like we need each other. We might not even like each other. And no matter how hard you work, things are not going to change overnight. That the situation that we find ourselves in didn't start yesterday and it's not going to end tomorrow. So we must prepare ourselves for generations of struggle and not get frustrated and throw in the towel when we don't have immediate results. How often do we hear, we need to promote black businesses and black people need to spend more money with each other. And then the brother said, well, I went to a black business and I didn't like the service and I decided I'm not going to deal with black folk anymore. I'm just going to deal with whatever I want, whoever I can get the best service. But we've had 400 years of abuse from these other folk. And a lot of us haven't given up on them. Brother, I just, again, say that as a learning experience, one of the things I've had to learn is patience. So we have to be very patient and we have to be loving. And perhaps the most important thing is to be able to just talk to each other without feeling like you have to be right all the time, without having the last word, without it turning into an argument. Sometimes I think the most important thing is just to listen. That's what sisters have told me all my life. Relationship after another. We're no color. We just at least be able to talk to each other. And if we can't talk to each other, then I don't think there's any hope. So we have to, that's called Sankofa, to reach mm-hmm. back and fess the things that made us great. What were the things that made us such a great, strong people? Let's retrieve those and try to apply them to the best of our ability today. What are those things that made us strong and successful people over time? And, and your studies and your research, what can you share with our audience in terms of African civilizations, either on the continent or around the world, that are useful lessons or tools or strategies that we could look to as we try to build and unite in America? I would say the most important thing stands out above everything else are the close family bonds, mother and father, husband and wife, parents and children, grandchildren, very close family bonds. You hear, you see records all the time of uh, Egyptian pharaohs paying homage to their grandparents and the ones who came before them. Close relationship between a man and woman. There was a level of, of trust and love that if we could retrieve that, hey brother, we'd be 99% of the way home. But it's easy to look at these things. It's more difficult apparently to apply them. Sometimes people say, Dr. Rashidi, just what do you think we should do? And I'm always a bit annoyed by that. A grown person saying, what should I do? And I say the basic things. They say, we, Dr. Rashidi, we love you. That's why we want to ask your opinion. We honor what you say. And I said, well, you need to spend more money with other black people. And you need to join an organization of like-minded people because you can't do it by yourself. And black men need to be with black women. And you need to take images of deities off your wall that don't look like you. And all those people who love me so much begin to say, well, Dr. Rashidi, I don't know if I can 
I can do all that because after all, love has no color and I don't see race, but you get your ass beat because you are black and excuse my language. And then on the other hand, I don't see race. I don't see color. And we're all the same. You can't have it both ways. So I think that one of the things we we have to do the most basic things. We have to support the scholars and the artists and the, the and the activists. We have to do the most basic things. We have to get more involved in our schools. We have to take responsibility for educating our children and not leave them to the dictates of the same people who enslaved and colonized us to it. Now that's really deep. Now here we are, basically turning our children over every day, speaking generally, to the descendants of the same people who colonized and enslaved us. Imagine if we had an economic base in our community that comes from spending money with each other. Imagine if black men married black women. What a statement that would make. And I don't hate anybody, but I love black people. I'm unapologetically in love with black folk. And I think that black folk are the most humane, the most forgiving, the most loving people in the world because we realize whether we are conscious of it or not, deep down inside, that everybody is our children. And so therefore we are prepared to embrace anybody and almost anything. It amazes me, in our community, a black person can be shot by a white person. It happens all the time. And before the body is buried, a sister, brother, family, I forgive them. I love them. Your comments on the humanity of black people makes me think to a certain extent about what Dr. Williams wrote in Destruction of Black Civilization, partially in terms of a lot of this destruction coming from being too open to outside ideas and people and forces and things of that nature. You know, you mentioned folks claiming to be colorblind and we're very forgiving. I know some of that comes from what's been bred into us with slavery, but I do believe that there is something within us that is more open and willing to share. Like we give away our cultural value daily and all the stuff that we exceed in in America. So it's interesting seeing how that plays out now and how we still aren't necessarily uh, much farther along than if something different would have occurred? Well, I don't think it's new. Now, slavery may have accentuated it or enslavement may have accentuated it and made it more clear. But I think historically you can find that. For example, we were talking about Africans in parts of the world we typically don't expect to find them. There was a significant African presence in the ancient Roman world. One of the great writers in the history of Rome is a man named Terence Afar. Terence Afar has two expressions that are so quintessentially African to me and that we can relate to today. He said, where there is life, there is hope. That's something people still repeat even now, that even no matter how dark the the midnight hour, the sun is going to come. Just hold on. That seems very African to me. And he also said, I am a man, and therefore nothing human is alien to me. A willingness to embrace even things that would seem strange, perhaps in other cultures. Now, Europeans are just the opposite of that. What has resonated with the current administration, perhaps more, build a wall, keep them out. Let's keep America white. That's really what make America great means. And many white folks embrace that. But Africans are not like that in general. That there's a, 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 a can we all just get along kind of philosophy. I don't think most black people have a desire to wreak vengeance on Europeans for enslavement and colonization. We just want to have a good life. We just want to be left alone. We want to have peace. Europeans seem to have a need to want to dominate and control. They seem to fear us even more than they hate us. They seem to be driven by a fear of black men, black women, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that these are the things that we need to explore. I think that we need to talk about these things as a people. And we need to talk to other people about it. As I said earlier, to me, perhaps the most important thing is the ability and willingness to communicate and to talk about even the most sensitive things if the world is going to be the place that we all want it to be. Yeah, I'd like to talk about uh, your work and your research about the Black presence in the Americas. I know you were a student and colleague of Dr. Van Sertema. For the past couple of years, there's been a, seems to be a movement of folks in our community who claim that Black folks are not African, but we are American Indians. Are you familiar with this? Well, of course. I think the expression is, now there's a lot to unpack there. So first, who is Ivan Van Sertema? Ivan Van Sertema is one of our preeminent scholars 
He's uh, transitioned in 2009. He was from um, Guyana, South America. He is most famous for a book called That Came Before Columbus, The African Presence in Ancient America. And it was his thesis, as he called it, that Africans came to America before Columbus, that the history of African people in the Americas didn't start with slavery. And he used as the primary example the Olmec civilization. O-L-M-E-C. The Olmec civilization is important to us because it is the parent civilization of the Americas. And Dr. Van Sertema's thesis, as he liked to say, was that Olmec civilization was a Native American civilization in which there was an African hierarchy. That at a certain point in time in the history and evolution of the Olmec, a small uh, a fleet of African people from the Nile Valley ended up on the shores of what is now Mexico, perhaps by accident, perhaps by design. You know, there are currents from West Africa that will take you to the Americas, whether you want to or not. If you have food and water and you survive, you're going to get there. And perhaps the fleet of ships blown off course from the Mediterranean, entered into the Atlantic and sailed to the Americas. And they impacted Olmec civilization in fundamental ways. They introduced the ability to move large objects in stone, agricultural science, so that you could feed more people, astronomy, just a number of basic fundamental things that had a profound influence on the other civilizations, the Aztec, the Inca, the Maya that came after. So naturally, this really shook things up. He was not the first person to talk about it. In fact, the first people to talk about the African presence among the Olmec were Mexican scholars themselves. In 1862, one of these massive stone heads with African features was found in Mexico by a Mexican scholar named Jose Melgar, referred to it as Ethiopian. The excavations of the heads began in the 1930s and 1940s. Matthew Sterling, a European-American who was the head of the expedition, found one of the heads and says it was amazingly Negroid. Another of the heads he nicknamed Joe Lewis. And so the Olmec civilization is very, very important. Now, I've been met fierce opposition, just like I do today. If I say that, and I'm not going to stop saying it, let's say on social media, people will say, Renoko, what you're doing is stealing Native American culture. Actually, just the opposite of that. We're talking about how Africans and Native Americans bonded and built together and lived together in peace and harmony for thousands of years. And we are not going to stop saying what is obvious. that There are numerous migrations of Africans to the Americas in ancient times. So that is Dr. Van Sertema's primary contribution. Now, there are two groups of folk in the United States uh, who dispute that, two movements. And one of them, they call themselves Aborigines. And their argument is that we didn't come from Africa at all, which is just nonsense, but that we've always been here. And what they do is they say that the the African-Americans who are in the United States and the Americas today are not here as a result of enslavement, We've always been here because we are the descendants of those original Africans. I consider that comical. What we need to understand is that history is a series of migrations. There were a number of movements of Africans to the Americas. Black people are the, are, were the first people to settle in the Americas tens of thousands of years ago. And then you have African people who sail across the Atlantic and impact classical civilization. And then you have African people who are captured and brought here. Now you have African people from the continent because Africa has been so raped and robbed and pillaged that come to the United States as students or business people or just people looking for a better way of life. So you have a whole series of movements in the Americas. And to say that African-Americans today are the descendants of those ancient Africans, you know, it's it's comical. And those people, I think, would deny the, the transatlantic slave trade. Why? Because we've been taught that Africa is the worst place in the world, so I don't really want to be an African, number one. And we want to separate ourselves from the horrors, the terrible things that happened during the transatlantic slave trade. Do you know that in Senegal, there's a place called Gori Island, a slave dungeon. And on this island, there was a dungeon for children. There was a dungeon for the men, the women, and children. Now, I want you to try to imagine having a young child in that dungeon. Daddy, mama, where are you? I'm afraid this man is hurting me. I'm hungry. I'm cold. And this level of insanity, uh, how black men could not protect black women, how black men could not protect themselves, the transatlantic voyage, 
So we would want to distance ourselves from them. But you cannot pretend that these things did not happen. You have to come to grips with it. And so I think that's at the root of the Aboriginal movement, anti-Africanism and an attempt to separate ourselves from the horrors of the transatlantic slave trade. So that movement is driven ideologically, not by facts. Mm. That's powerful. Um, And there's a lot of people that are subscribing to this. And uh, it's just troubling to see, you know, I know self-hate plays out in many ways. So this, you know, self-hate isn't new, but it's just fascinating to me to see how how it's playing out in this, this most recent form like this. And then you have another group. Their view is we're not African at all. That we may have been taken from Africa, but we got nothing to do with Africa. We're on our own. We are African Americans. We fought for this country. We built this country. Africans have never done anything for us. Let's fight for reparations. Let's not vote, et cetera, et cetera. I would say that these movements are also, you know, we have agents in our midst. And we have people whose mission in life is to cause disruption and confusion. There's nothing new there. And so I think that we also have to be aware of outside influences that drive these movements. That's real. That's real. They've been up to those tricks for a while now. So I definitely, definitely know what you're saying. And I think this all comes back to the knowledge of self you were talking about and being able to understand who we are and embrace the richness of our history. But I think that, you know, we have to know that history first. No, I'm, I'm a living example of that. Until I was about 15 or 16, if you had called me black, if you had called me African, those were fighting words. Mm. We were going to roll in the mud. Mm. Now, if you say I'm not an African, we got issues. Because now I've come full circle. I could not be more proud of my African heritage. I see myself as an African in America. Mm. And I do have a new book called The Black Image in, in Antiquity, Beautiful, Rural, and Divine. And this book has 200 of my best photographs of African artifacts from the museums of the world before the transatlantic slave trade. Mm. Why is it important for our people to understand and know that black folks have existed and do exist in huge numbers all around the world where we might not even expect? Why is just this important for folks to know? Well, I think it's empowering to know that we are not some small minority, that black folk make up a billion people scattered around the world. And I think just knowing that, the vast numbers that we are, and that we have, we're scattered all over the earth, I think that in and of itself is empowering. So we have no reason to look down on Africa. We have no reason to look at Africa as this poor place that never had civilization, and we should be thankful that other people came and got us out of the muck and the mire. We just need to begin to study history again from our perspective. The expression goes, until the lion has an historian or lioness, the hunter will always be a hero. Well, I'm a lion, and I'm going to roar until I can't do it anymore. And it's good to be able to share this information with sisters and brothers like yourselves who are going to take this information to an audience that I could probably never reach. And I'm grateful to you for that. All right, all right. So just like that, we're at the end of this episode of Black History Year. This podcast is produced by Push Black, the nation's largest nonprofit black media company. You know, at Push Black, we agree with Marcus Garvey when he said, a people without knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. I'm guessing you probably feel like that's important too. I mean, you're here at the end of a podcast about black history. You matter. Your choice to be here matters. It lets us know that you value the work. Push Black exists because we saw we had to take matters into our own hands. You make Push Black happen with your contributions at blackhistoryyear.com. Most people do about five or 10 bucks a month, but everything makes a difference. Thanks for supporting the work. The Black History Year production team includes Tariq Alani, Patrick Sanders, William Anderson, Jerea Bradley, Brooke Brown, Shonda Buchanan, Escadar Getahoon, Leslie Taylor Grover, Abney Jones, Aquia Tay, Darren Wallace, and our producer, Sydney Smith. For Limina House, our producers are Jessica Rue France and Sasha Kai Parker, who also edits the podcast. 
Black History Year's executive producers are Julian Walker for Push Black and Michael L. Sesser for Lemon House. I'm Jay for Push Black. Thanks for checking us out. Peace.